So uh, this talk actually is a, a bit of a summary or, or will kind of summarize all the things that we mentioned because I think really the key to post-operative uh, considerations is really preventing uh, uh, the complications in the pre-operative uh, and intraoperative period. So we'll go through some of the um, sort of basic issues with regards to post-operative care uh, for any laparoscopic procedures or in general, um, and then some of the complications or um, po uh, problems that can occur related to access and closure injuries, pneumoperitoneum, and uh, procedure or exposure-related complications. So uh, post-operative nausea um, actually can be a huge problem uh, in, in some patients depending on the procedure that you've done. And the key really is to treat often, uh, treat early, and even start it before the operation starts and in the intraoperative period working with your anesthesiologist. Um, I always ask patients as well prior to uh, uh, sort of in the preoperative visit if they've ever had general anesthesia before and if they've had a lot of nausea and vomiting so we can alert the anesthetist to that and try to prevent it in the postoperative period. Because uh, certainly, um, some if you've repaired a large parasophageal hernia and the patient is forcing uh, to vomit and retch after that operation, that can certainly disrupt things. Um, I have had to take one patient back for a severe, forceful uh, vomiting after a parasophageal hernia repair. So certainly, if you've gone into anastomosis there and so on, there's really um, uh, uh, it's a, it's actually an important thing to try and think about prior to the surgery. Um, some of these agents can be helpful, uh, and a lot of them, as you can see, if you use propofol as an induction agent or if your anesthesiologist uh, uh, does, uh, this can be helpful in, presenting, uh, in preventing uh, uh, nausea in the postoperative period. Certainly, odanzatron, if it's given about a half an hour prior to uh, the patient waking up, can also be very effective. Uh, and it can be used as well in the postoperative period. Uh, intraoperative steroids is a very inexpensive and effective way of preventing uh, nausea related, uh, anesthesia related nausea. Uh, and of course, in the postoperative period, don't be shy if patients have nausea. I always warn them to speak up early um, so that it can be treated effectively. Uh, sometimes, very rarely, we do have to place an NG tube if the patients are really uh, retching. And I, I will do that, especially if the operation uh, is something like a Nissen or something that you really don't want them forcing uh, at the hiatus, then um, don't wait too long if they're really having trouble and you can't control it with medication to temporarily place a, a nasogastric tube. Um, so uh, in summary, so preventing also uh, the nausea and vomiting that can be related to the administration of narcotics. Um, of course, uh, infiltrating, as we spoke about, the, uh, the incision sites, uh, trocar sites prior to uh, placing the trocars or making the incision can help uh, minimize pain in that area, and even infiltrating them postoperatively can help as well. Uh, and using non-narcotic -nar pain medication or maximizing the use of non-narcotic pain, pain medication, uh, oftentimes patients won't even require narcotics in the postoperative period if they're well covered with anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, we usually give it to them for three days after something like a, a laparoscopic hernia repair or a lap coli or something. Uh, for three days, uh, twice a day, uh, unless they have any contraindications, we give them some um, uh, NSAIDs and patients will come back in the postoperative period and say they never even filled their prescription for the narcotic medications. Um, and, and so that can be very good, especially present, preventing complications related to uh, uh, narcotic uh, uh, narcotics. Bupivacaine is what we use to infiltrate the incisions prior to uh, uh, placing the trocars. Uh, there is a limit to how much you can give, so you should know what those numbers are. Um, and this might be on the test as well, I think. Um, a good rule of thumb is sort of if you're using quarter percent uh, marcaine, uh, it's about 70 cc's uh, in a 70 kilogram person, and most of the time you won't need that much as, uh, at all. Um, and of course, always being careful. It's, it's pretty hard to inject, inject it into a major vessel when you're injecting into the abdominal wall, but if you're anywhere near the epigastric or something, you want to pull back. You kind of want to avoid the epigastrics anyway, so that might be a good way of, of seeing where you are, but mostly under direct vision shouldn't be a problem, really. Postoperative pain, um, often well, more than 50% of patients will have pain uh, referred to the shoulders after uh, a laparoscopic surgery. Uh, I often warn them about this prior to the operation so that they're not surprised and they think, did somebody do something to my shoulders? Or, um, and it can take a few days to go away. It's related to irritation of the diaphragm. And uh, so it's important to try and evacuate as much of the uh, CO2 
as possible at the end of the operation, uh, keep one of the trocars in and really try to desiflate the abdomen as much as possible. Um, wound care is pretty much the same as it would be for any open operation, um, whether you use uh, absorbable or non-absorbable sutures to close up the skin incisions. Most people would use absorbable and bury them in the skin. Uh, it gives a nice cosmetic result and um, they can shower. We put actually occlusive dressings and then patients can shower immediately after the operation, but same principles as you would pretty much use for um, any incision that you make. And um, d instructions to the patient, again, similar to what you would do in open surgery, if there's any signs of infection, discharge, um, redness, uh, or increasing pain in the area, then they would obviously come back or, or come and see you. And diet, again, is, is more dependent, I think, on the operation that you do than on the technique that you use. But in uh, laparoscopic surgery, uh, we tend to try and uh, feed patients early. Uh, and certainly things like a, a lab coli or a hernia repair, they can start eating immediately after uh, the operation, unless, of course, they have nausea or, or <laughs> related to the anesthetic. And then there are some other procedures um, that may require a, a little bit more... Um, uh, maybe one or two days of, uh, of not eating, depending on if you have an anastomosis or if you want to do a swallowing study beforehand. Um, certainly, uh, operations done at the distal esophagus may also be involved with some edema in the postoperative period. Like, for example, a heller might require a soft diet or a soft mechanical diet for a couple of days afterwards. But this is pretty much more dependent on the uh, type of operation that you do. Activity restrictions, so what's great about the small incisions for laparoscopic surgery is that we won't, don't really need to restrict activities in terms of um, the incisions, so patients can pretty much go back to what they were doing before, uh, you know, within reason and sort of listening to their own bodies. If it hurts, then they might want to slow down for a couple of days. Um, and they're really the best judge of that, so we don't need to particularly restrict them for the small incisions. However, of course, there may be some patient-related factors, like if they are on uh, uh, large doses of steroids, if they've had a large pelvic reconstruction, um, or a larger incision for extraction sites and so on, if you're doing a donor nephrectomy or something like that. Um, and this would also just be dependent on, on how large the incision was and the other patient-related factors. Um, and uh, also, if perhaps if a patient's had an incisional hernia repair or groin hernia repair, you might want to limit their heavy lifting activities. This thing's alive sometimes, yeah, I guess. Yeah, so. Yeah. so access related injuries. This was sort of covered in many of the uh, other talks as well, but I'll sort of just review uh, what's here. So um, uh, especially if you're using a varus needle or if you're going to go up near the costal margins, it's a good idea to put an NG tube in um, to decompress the stomach, especially if it may have been a difficult intubation and they filled up the stomach with air. It's a good idea to decompress that before you put the varus needle in. Uh, if you're concerned about an injury to the stomach, uh, things that may give you a clue to that would be bile staining or blood in the NG tube, or if you're losing your pneumoperitoneum, if there's a gaping hole in the stomach and there's an NG tube in there suctioning on it, it's possible, but I don't think I've ever seen that before, but these are things that you could um, suspect. Um, previous incisions obviously uh, can be a risk for, um, if there's adhesions of the small bowel to the incision, uh, the, there can be injuries, so trying to avoid those incisions for your initial access site is always a good idea. And then thinking about injuries related to energy sources, coupling, uh, things that may have happened outside of your field of view. So if you have problems in the post-operative period, to sort of keep that in the back of your mind. And uh, if you're using any bougies or other instrumentation that's being placed as well, to always make sure that the person who's placing it has uh, done that before and doesn't use excessive force. Um, you know, it can be pretty... Uh, devastating to see a blue thing coming into your field of view. So those are all things to think about even before uh, starting your operation. Bladder injuries can also occur if you're using uh, trocars uh, in the suprapubic area. Uh, most of the time uh, for like inguinal hernias or appendixes, um, we used to place Foley catheters or do ins and outs. Now we just have the patient's void or prior to the operation. Um, and oftentimes, or most of the time, you can actually see the rim of the bladder and, and avoid injury to that area. Um, of course, if there's any question, you can always 
how, how, or if you have a Foley in, or if you don't place one in and do a, a saline test to make sure there isn't, um, when you remove the trocar, if you're worried about that at all, you can have your, um, uh, one of the nurses just fill the, for the Foley catheter up with a 200, 300 cc's of saline to make sure there isn't any leak, or you can even add some methylene blue in that. Vascular injuries, sort of uh, more of an intraoperative problem, but can uh, obviously uh, show up in the postoperative period if you're not vigilant about it. We already mentioned or we spoke about injuries to the epigastric vessels, uh, and that if, you, if you're watching your trocars as they come out and you see some bleeding, you, you can often do some transvascular suturing of that area. Um, major retroperitoneal bleeding, you should always look uh, uh, at your initial site after you place your either varus needle or trocar, and then of course at the end of the procedure make sure there's no uh, missed injury, expanding hematoma or anything like that. Uh, injury to uh, mesenteric vessels or hilum of a solid organ, all of this can cause you major problems after uh, an operation, um, and so checking everything out uh, prior to uh, uh, ending the operation is of course uh, uh, a very good idea, same as what you would do in an open operation. So uh, we often see actually subcutaneous emphysema in the postoperative period, um, and uh, it really sometimes looks much worse than it really is. Um, sometimes, especially in foregut surgery, there can be some tracking of the CO2 into the subcutaneous space, even up into the neck or the face area of a patient, and it looks um, a lot worse than it is. It's usually not very painful and will, will resorb after a few hours as you know CO2 is very easily absorbed. Uh, we spoke about gas embolism. These, all of these things shouldn't really occur in the post-operative period, um, uh, but are things that can occur intraoperatively and things that you should be thinking about, obviously. Pneumothorax, so if you're working up in the uh, uh, mediastinum or in the foregut area, you can sometimes injure the pleura. Uh, if it's a very, very tiny injury and air is leaking in um, under positive pressure, that can sometimes create what we uh, sort of a tension pneumothorax, the physiology of a tension pneumothorax. What you can do in that circumstance, if you recognize it or you see that that's what's happening, you can actually just make the hole a little bit larger and that will actually allow air to come out and not only go in. Um, other things that you can do, obviously, are uh, a needle in the chest or placing a chest tube, but we rarely have to do that, actually. Uh, most of the time, the anesthesiologist can compensate for that. And then in the post-operative period, it resorbs uh, so quickly that it rarely causes a problem because there really is no air leak. It's just an injury into the pleura where air escaped. So once you evacuate the pneumoperitoneum, you can place a red rubber catheter into the pleural space while you're emptying the, abdomen, uh, emptying the gas out of the abdomen. It's sort of at the end of the procedure. Um, and attach, bring that out of one of the port sites and attach like a Tumi syringe with a water seal onto it. Have your anesthetist give a few uh, positive pressure ventilation if you really want to evacuate that space. But really, it, it rarely is a problem. And unless the patient is having any respiratory difficulties post-operatively, we don't even get a chest x-ray anymore. Um, other things to think about uh, related to the specific procedure that you've done. Um, could there have been an injury to, um, uh, related to one of the heat sources that you used, um, in a, or um, vascular injury, bowel injury? I mean, we've sort of mentioned all of these things, nerve injuries related to, uh, related to positioning uh, or dissection, depending on what you're doing. Um, So risk of neuropathy really is, is the same as it would be for an open operation. You have to think about these things prior uh, uh, when you're positioning the patient. Um, and uh, depending if the arms are out, you can get brachial plexus injuries related to stretch. Um, and, and these are all sort of things that you would think about if patients presented with a specific problem. problem. Anatomy of the inguinal area. So we see here the triangle of pain often referred uh, two, when talking about the anatomy of the inguinal area, um, lateral there and below the iliopubic tract, so try and avoid that area, especially uh, not placing tacks or anything. Um, if a patient complains uh, of pain uh, related to a hernia repair immediately after in recovery room, it might actually even be best to take them back immediately because it might indicate that there's a tack or a clip or something, uh, and the best thing to do would be to take it out uh, right away to avoid a chronic pain in the future. 
Um, this was mentioned as well in, in, the, in, the, in many of the other talks, but obviously all of these heat sources that you're using stay hot uh, after you've used them, and so avoid touching the bowel or doing dissection with a hot tip instrument. You can sometimes uh, put it on the liver, on the surface of the liver if you want to cool it off, or switch instruments uh, uh, if you want to do some dissection. We've mentioned this uh, many times before. Uh, inspecting your operative sites and the port sites after removal, um, and inadvertent injury to organs, especially when you're putting instruments in your trocar, so try and keep them in a field of view. If you're working with a, a novice that really hasn't mastered the depth perception and know where they are in space to back up the camera and make sure you see their scissors coming into the abdomen, they're not sort of running into a loop of small bowel on their way there. Um, and using all your retractors, sometimes uh, you can have someone retracting something outside of the field of view, um, and you're trying to really create the best exposure, and you're not, if you're not really looking or seeing uh, what's going on outside of the field of view, there can be injury to structures that you're not seeing. For example, if you're really retracting um, on the esophagus and pushing into the pancreas, you can get pancreatitis after, um, uh, and things like that. So you want to actually make sure that the tips that you're working with are always in your field of view, and that you have an awareness of um, uh, where everybody's hands are, especially if you're, you have multiple trocars in and multiple instruments. Close all port sites that are uh, larger than 10 millimeters, uh, and we've mentioned this before, and you can either close them uh, directly uh, by under direct vision just with a, a open technique, or you can use a card Thomas or suture pass or anything like that. Tends to be very handy in larger patients or more obese patients. It's much easier to do it under laparoscopically under direct vision. And so think about these things uh, when you're, uh, uh, before you are leaving the abdomen, so, or postoperatively if there's problems, uh, injuries to the abdominal wall or uh, uh, to the missed bowel injuries or bladder injuries, ureter injuries, um, and of course try and evacuate all of the CO2 before you're, you, uh, you finish the operation. So in summary, it's a lot of these things related to pain, nausea, wound care are pretty much similar to open surgery and no real limitations on, on activities, which is uh, one of the, the big advantages. Uh, and of course, it's going to be procedure specific. Um, access injuries are best um, prevented uh, and of course managed depending on where they are and what the specific situation is. That's and, and, and just finally, pneumoperitoneum or procedure related. Know your environment, uh, make sure you have a good uh, uh, knowledge of, of the technology that you're using and the limitations of that technology. Um, and port site hernias and things like that, it's really preventative and just sort of as a rule, closing all of them um, to, to prevent hernias in the future. That's all I got. <laughs>